What is your favorite story? Now, I might not be able to guess off the top of my head what your favorite story is, but I bet I can tell you why you like it so much. Um, you probably like that particular movie or book or just story in general because it somehow, on some level, in some way, it, it connects with your story. Uh, it, it mirrors uh, what you've experienced or it, it has given you deeper glimpses into how you see yourself. Um, now, this month we will be looking at classic Christian allegories. And it's a, it's a sermon series that I've been looking forward to for about a year now, uh, putting the ideas together and, and looking at this, this arc of different sermons. Uh, I'll be preaching the first one, and then uh, I have, I've asked some specific people to preach uh, some over the next number of Sabbaths for this month. And I think that you'll really enjoy each one of these, these allegories that have been written um, over the past 2,000 years up until a couple of years ago. So this is a, a, a great experience. And before we get into it, though, will you pray with me? God, our Father, the, the master storyteller, the, uh, the author of our story, thank you for giving us these glimpses into how you see us uh, through scripture and, um, and how we can keep our faith in you uh, through our own experiences. Uh, Lord, thank you for the creativity and investment that so many people have put into these, these valuable works of, of art and of spiritual encouragement. Um, give us your guidance as we talk about them, as we contemplate uh, these stories as well as our own. Uh, give us new insights into how you see us and uh, what our journey has been like in, uh, as we continue moving forward um, into eternity. I, I pray and ask these things in Jesus' incredible name. Amen. Now, allegories. Uh, what is an allegory? I had to do some research myself to understand exactly what it was. I've used the term allegory on occasion and uh, without fully understanding all the nuances of the word. And so I, as I was looking up allegory, I also thought, well, let me look and understand what a parable is. And let me also understand what a fable is. And uh, in doing this research, an allegory turns out to be defined as an, as an umbrella term for uh, parables and fables. And so uh, a particular story might be called an allegory, it might be called um, a fable, and it might be called a parable. Uh, classically, fables are, are sto moral stories that involve animals uh, speaking specifically. Um, and uh, parables are everything else. However, there's a lot of crossover between them that's recognized, and so they're not siloed terms. They, they can be used almost interchangeably in certain contexts. So uh, allegories, fables, parables, it's all good. Uh, but allegories are different than just any old story. Um, a lot of our movies and books that we consume today uh, are, are written for entertainment purposes. Uh, sometimes they're written to, to teach a certain lesson, but they're not necessarily allegories because they don't have the, the symbolism, um, but, they, but they are uh, paralleling uh, a particular issue or they're, they're shining um, a light or a focus on, on a particular needed uh, topic. So uh, it, it's not just any story is an allegory, but these allegories, um, allegories are intentionally written. They, are, they have an intentional interpretation that is embedded in the story by the author. And uh, it's written to teach 
a particular point or make a specific commentary. And maybe you can think of some movies or some books that, that do this incredibly well that you've appreciated um, in your exposure to them. Uh, Jesus, when he, when he told parables, he had points to them. Uh, it's not like looking at a, a piece of abstract art where you see the piece of art and, and you think, well, to me, this means this, or it, it evokes this certain feeling in me. And uh, what is that? What do you get out of it? And, and there isn't a particular intention, even from the original artist. Um, but with, with allegories, there is. And Jesus had points when he was making these stories um, so he could teach these things. These, uh, and the allegories in particular, we're not just going to be looking at even any of Jesus's parables. We're going to be looking specifically at the parables that have um, commentary on, on the personal faith journey. Uh, as as it goes through. And uh, I thought it was pretty interesting. This was an English Standard Bible. Uh, and English Standard, it says in Matthew chapter 13, Matthew 13 um, and verse 34 and 35, the verses, uh, it says, uh, in the King James Version, I'm sorry, it says, without a parable, he spake not. Uh, referring to Jesus, that Jesus always spoke with a parable, and this is what it is in, an, in a version that makes a little more sense. All these things Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fill what was spoken by the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. Oh, that's cool stuff. Allegories do for us what other forms of literature do not. Um, uh, in, in this context. So uh, an allegory will allow some personal distance between us and the, the particular moral point. Uh, <laughs> it allows us to look at somebody else's story and so we're not uh, triggered initially and, and we might be able to slip into the story and really appreciate it until suddenly we realize it's talking about us. Um, in the Old Testament, there were a lot of parables, a lot of uh, allegories used throughout the Old Testament. It's not just something that Jesus started. Um, and there's in Ezekiel, in the book of Ezekiel chapter 23, there's this story of these sisters, this, this allegory of these sister wives, um, uh, two sisters married to, to the same person. And uh, I can't say their names right. Ohola and Oholiba, uh, these two sisters, great names, right? And uh, it goes in and it starts talking about these sisters and uh, how, they, how they behaved and what the decisions they made and, and the way they were unfaithful to their marriage vow. And it, it goes through their stories and then God turns around and says, well, the first sister is your neighbor. And, and I'm sure the listeners to that were like, yeah, that's right. They are the neighbor that there and then he says, and the second one was worse. Oh, how terrible. And the second one is you. Uh, <laughs> uh, so the, it allows her personal emotional distance in order to be able to uh, build that connection. And I think the other Bible writers, they did this also in different mechanisms, uh, other literature mechanisms. And uh, it, so it allows her personal emotional distance from the subject matter. Okay. It also, I, I am observing that it also allows the freshness of perspective. In uh, the book of Judges, chapter 9, uh, verses 8 to 15, Judges chapter 9, there's a story about this, uh, the trees uh, that the prophet is, is telling about these trees that say, oh, we need to build uh we i mean we want a king to reign over us and so then they go to they go to this great tree and then they go to a, a lesser tree and then they go to a a, a grapevine and then uh a, 
a, a fig tree and then a grape tree and then and eventually they get down to this bramble <laughs> this weed and they're like will you reign over us and the bramble's like yeah i'm gonna reign over you and i'm gonna i'm gonna squelch you all with fire you know it's <laughs> just like why what are you doing it gives a lot of it gives a fresh perspective on what was happening politically uh in in that time and uh so that 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 allegory, it gave that distance and it gave that perspective. Um, I think that uh, allegories also, they, they measure our own recipe, uh, how we receive the uh, message because uh, once we finally get it, it allows us that space um, in, in two different ways. First, it clarifies our judgment. So, um, it clarifies like our judgment of others and then it clarifies our judgment of ourselves. So for instance, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, Nathan the prophet comes to David and says, David, you know, you were a shepherd, right? Let me tell you this story about a sheep and a man that loved his, his pet sheep so much that he ate with it at his table. And you can imagine David, he's thinking, oh, what a great story, I used to eat with my sheep. Oh, you know, and then, and, uh, and so he gets all emotionally invested in this story and then Nathan turns around and he, he says, and then there was someone else, a, a rich man had hundreds of sheep, but then uh, he went and he stole that man's sheep. And David, he goes, oh, how dare somebody do that? And, and eventually David says, you know, that man deserves to die. And then Nathan turns around and says, you are that man. Oh, no. So uh, David, he was able, it, clar it clarified his judgment that had become clouded. It had become uh, filled with all of these, these personal uh, agendas, uh, these passions, these, these thoughts. Um, these animosities even, just and, and self-deceptions. Um, all of that had creeped up into his mind, but somehow, because it was a different situation, because it was an allegory, he was able to see clearly uh, and even cast judgment on, on this man who ended up being himself. Um, and then also allegories, they allow us to see, uh, they, they allow us, this one was hard to recognize for me. Allegories also allow us, as much as they're able to see clearly, they also allow us not to see the point. Um, and Jesus said in Matthew chapter 13, in uh, 13, 13, he said this. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand, and you will indeed see, but never perceive, for this people's heart has grown dull, and with their ears they can, hard, they can barely hear, and their eyes they have closed, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them." A very sad reality, and to me that reminds me of, of probably the uh, uh, another book full of symbolism in Revelation in the, in the, the seventh church um, of Laodicea that that they they think that they're rich and in need of nothing but in fact they're they're poor and destitute and naked and they need everything um, that's a state that we all can be in in different areas of our lives in some areas we've we've seen something through the uh, an allegory uh, that Jesus taught um, but not realize that it also applies to another area of our experience there are lots of parables, lots of allegories, lots of stories of, a lot of allegories of personal faith journey that we could go into that Jesus taught. But I, I wanna look at two specific chapters uh, today. So for uh, the first one, we've been looking already in Matthew chapter 13. So in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus, he tells this 
this story, uh, a uh, this story of three stories that are stories of lost. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, these stories of of uh, these stories of soils. So there are um, different soils that are in that are represented. First, we have the the compact hard earth, and that we uh, and then there's the there's soil that is rocky, and then there's a third soil that is is good soil but it has thorns in it, and then finally you have the good soil with no thorns in it, and it's about this sower, this seed, this uh, farmer that's planting seeds, and he's planting like this in in Jesus's parable in his in his allegory, woo 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 woo, and it's kind of ridiculous because what what farmer actually does that? over all these different types of land. But in this, in Jesus's allegory, this is a, this is a very freely flowing um, uh, distribution of, of precious seed that each one, each piece has the potential to do something amazing. Um, so he, he talks about that this, this farmer, after he sows this seed, that some of the seed, it lands on that hard packed soil and, and the birds come and they eat away that seed and fly away and, and the seed doesn't even have a chance to, to do anything. In the second soil, there is, uh, it's stony, so the seeds do fall down, the birds can't get to it, but when it springs up, it doesn't have the ability for roots to go down any deeper than than underneath the rocks. And when it springs up, then the sun, because it doesn't have a good root, then the sun withers it away. Um, and then it goes on to another kind of soil that has weeds in it, and the seed falls among the weeds, and it springs up, and it gets good roots, but then those thorns, those uh, weeds and the thorns, they, they choke the plant as it's growing up, so it doesn't produce any fruit. And then finally, you have the good fruit, uh, the good soil that the seed falls into, and it, and it, it springs up, it buries deep, and it produces fruit uh, many fold over and over again. So there's uh, these different soils. And Jesus, he tells this to the people that are listening. And he, he says these things, you know, uh, without a parable, I don't speak to the people. And I say these things in parables so that way they'll hear and not understand. Um, but then to the disciples, he pulls them aside and, and, well, they ask, you know, like, what do these things mean? Tell us the interpretation of these allegories, because obviously you're talking about something more than just seed. Um, it's not just an instruction manual. So, so Jesus, he, he says, well, let me tell you. And so he, he goes and he says, well, the, the, the seed that falls on the hard pack soil, well, that seed, and when the birds come, the evil one, whenever those, the seed is, is the word of God, and when the word of God gets into someone's mind, the, the enemy comes and swoop, you know, takes it away, distracts them, and they have, they, they, there's not even, it can't even take root in their mind. Um, and then in the second soil, well, the, some people, they hear the word of God and they rejoice and they're like, oh, that's so wonderful. But then the, the sun comes out because they don't have a root. There's nothing deep about their experience and the word of God, it just, it just shrivels away um, and doesn't, doesn't, isn't able to, to stay. And then there's, there's some people's minds that are like the, the third soil where the seed falls, the, the good word of God, it comes into their minds and, and it, and it does, it, it springs up and it, it goes down deep and it's, it's great. But then because there's so many cares about the world, so many, so many anxieties and concerns and considerations that they are, uh, that are, are worldly ambitions and, and fears and things that are, uh, that don't come from faith and trust in God, those things, they, they're, they're so strong. They just, they choke out the ability for that, the word of God to to produce actual fruit in their lives. Um, and then finally, there's, there's the good soil, uh, the, the mind that is receptive, that, doesn't, that has had all these weeds pulled out uh, intentionally by that, by that individual and, and with the help of God. And, and it's able to 
grow up and dig deep and the word of God then produces fruit. Um, and we know the fruits of the spirit, the peace, love, joy, patience, kindness, and these things they do are produced. Um, and uh, so he tells these to the disciples and they think, oh, that's, uh, you know, and they have contemplations about it. But I think for, for us, when we hear this story and we're thinking, well, where am I in this story? Um, well, that's for you to decide. Um, maybe as I've been rehearsing this story for you, um, reviewing this allegory, you've been thinking about some other people uh, in your life. Oh, that's so and so. Oh, the third so the the third one is is I know that's my family member. Oh, the second one that's my best friend, and uh, that's what's going on there. And you're thinking about these other people. Where are you in this journey? Um, the these soils uh, because it. Jesus was speaking to uh, a people group that were very familiar with planting seed. Uh, if, they, if, not, if they hadn't done it themselves, they'd watched it their whole lives from, from people who were in that profession. And so they understood that, you know, if you get a piece of soil, that you, a plot of land that you're going to be working, um, you, you, it's going to take a lot of work. And that you can turn hard packed soil into soil that has depth, into soil that doesn't have, that you've de weeded, um, that you've weeded, and, or, and into good soil that finally all the stones have been taken out, all the weeds are not growing there um, anymore, and that whatever you plant there will grow up to produce fruit uh, so you can live. On, on it. So there is this, there's this understanding. But I think today we look at this, this uh, allegory and we think, oh no, you know, where am I in this? I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm the soil number two, I'm soil number one. Um, but this is a, an allegory of hope. This is an allegory of promise that, there, that w we can put in this, this intentional work to, to make our, our soil receptive for the word of God, if this is something that we truly want. And it's something that the hearers in those days would have heard and, and it would have fallen in those different ways. But Jesus kept teaching, Jesus kept preaching, Jesus kept telling stories, and, uh, and he still does it today, so that's beautiful. The other area that Jesus uh, spoke some allegories that I'd like to talk about is in Luke chapter 15. Um, this is what I started going on before, that Luke chapter 15, Jesus, he tells these, these three stories uh, of lostness, that uh, there are three, three allegories of things being lost because he's trying to reach, um, he's trying to help people understand. And if we just began the story uh, in the reading with that allegory, we'd miss out on something very intentional. So I'm going to begin right at the, uh, we won't read the whole thing, but just right there at, at the first part of Luke chapter 15. And I'm reading from the extreme faith version. <laughs> I love this. Uh, uh, I just got it. It's I'm super stoked. So it's, it reads like this. Tax collectors and sinners were all crowding around to listen to Jesus. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law of Moses started grumbling. This man is friendly with sinners. He even eats with them. Verse 3, then Jesus told them this story. You can admit, if you picture this context that Jesus is telling this allegory, which is always very intentional, uh, important to understand who is the audience for this allegory um, as Jesus is telling this story he he has the the religious elite in front of him and then he has these people that have been rejected by the religious elite crowding into their space uh, into this luncheon as you see the context is and uh, they're saying, why are these other people coming in here? This is, this is, I don't, you know, we rejected them for a reason. They're, they're, they've got, 
they got issues. And uh, so then Jesus in their presence of both of these types of people in these groups of people, um, he tells these allegories and, he, and I'm just going to read the first one. Then Jesus told them this story. If any of you has a hundred sheep and one of them gets lost, what will you do? Won't you leave the 99 in the field and go look for the lost sheep until you find it? And when you find it, you will be so glad that you'll put it on your shoulder and carry it home. Then you will call in your friends and neighbors and say, let's celebrate. I've lost my lost sheep. I've found my lost sheep. Jesus said, in the same way, there is more happiness in heaven because of one sinner who turns to God than over 99 good people who don't need to. That's the first story. I'll let you read the rest for yourself. Jesus, he tells these allegories because uh, he, he mentions, well, sheep. Uh, the people in those days, they were very familiar with sheep. And they know the value of one sheep. And it's one out of a hundred. Um, and so as he's, as he's telling this story, maybe some people said, wow, that's pretty significant. Maybe some people said, ah, I don't know, one out of a hundred, that's a lot of work to go look, running up and down the mountainside to go look for one sheep. Um, sheep have more sheep, so <laughs> I could just wait longer, uh, and I'll have a hundred again. Um, uh, so Jesus, he then ups the ante and he moves on to another allegory. And he tells a story about a, a woman that has lost one coin, one out of ten. And uh, this, this precious coin, one out of ten, uh, that she sweeps a whole house looking for it. And uh, she can't find it. And, and, and so she just continues. Uh, she lights a lamp and she searches until she finds it. And when she finds it, she, re she tells her friends and neighbors, you know, come and rejoice with me uh, because the, the coin that I lost was found. And the people listening might think, wow, that's, you know, yeah, I'd, I'd search for that too. Uh, for a coin, I might not search for a sheep, but I'll certainly search for a coin. But then others might think it's one out of 10 coins. You know, you still got nine left. And so then Jesus ups the ante again and he says, what about... There's a man that has two sons, and one son decides to leave. And he tells the story of the prodigal son. Um, I think, you know, each, each of these stories I preached on before um, multiple times, and we've read probably many, many times. And if you haven't, you can read it for yourself in uh, Matthew chapter 13 and Luke chapter 15. Um, among other places in the Bible. But I think that these, these allegories as a whole, as a body of work uh, of what Jesus had, had put out there, they, they remind us, they underline the fact that our experiences in coming to God, in the experiences, the places we're at now and the places we've been and the places where the, the journey that we're going are varied. Our experiences are different than other people's experiences. Um, now, we might hear someone else's experience and say, oh, that part is my story, or, or that one resonates with my own, or yours is very inspiring to me. And so these, these allegories are, are valuable in this way. Um, but these, these experiences that Jesus explains um, are... Are, these symbols are, res, are to resonate with our own hearts and for us to, one, have faith and encouragement for our own journey and then also to appreciate the journeys of other people that we come in contact with, that we hear their story. Um, you know, I want you to ask yourself, what is your story? What is your journey with Jesus? Um, as you read through these story, these allegories of Jesus um, in these places and other places in Scripture, and also as we look at these other classic Christian allegories um, like Pilgrim's Progress or Chronicles of Narnia or The Shack, as we look through these different um, uh, classic Christian allegories, think about how they connect with your own story and uh, if you haven't read them, I encourage you to read them for yourselves or to experience those, those allegories for yourself. 
uh, because these these have been written and have given such incredible encouragement over the years uh, for so many people. And I want that, as your pastor, I want that kind of uh, foundation encouragement in the Word of God and in these, um, uh, these allegories for you to be in your life uh, that, you can, that you can reflect on and you can see your own story in. Let's pray together. Our wonderful Father in heaven, thank you for the gift of your Son Jesus to give us salvation so freely, to, for himself to be the capstone of our, of our experience, the, the foundation under our feet and, and the one that is walking by our side all along the way. God, thank you for the promise that you are, will never leave us or forsake us, that you will sustain us, um, that we can trust in you through our varied experiences. Thank you for the stories you've given us in scripture and the stories that uh, resemble our own journey so far. Help us to see ourselves more clearly through your eyes and trust you every step of the way. And I ask these things in Jesus' eternal name. Amen. May God bless you. And I'll see you next week.